Today on Engine Power, Ford's Classic 351 Windsor grows up and becomes a 427 cubic inch stroker. The goal is over double its original power. Welcome to Engine Power. 1963 was the dawn for a performance icon. 54 years later, the 427 FE is still a hot topic when discussing high-performance Ford engines. Now, equally effective in NASCAR and drag racing, it won its fair share of races, earning it a great reputation in automotive history. The 427 was a true 425.98 cubic inches. Due to several race organizations having a maximum displacement of seven liters, and this being a race engine in Ford's book, they called it a 427. It was available in a side oiler and a top oiler design. It shares the same stroke as the 390, but has a larger bore. Several variations were produced and power ranged from 390 to 425. It powered vehicles like this 64 Thunderbolt. It was a limited production, factory experimental drag race only car. 100 were built and it won the 1964 NHRA Superstock title for Ford. You could also drool over the 427 between the frame rails of Shelby Cobras. They were used starting in 1964. It powered the Cobra to a GT championship. The engine was available with both low and mid-rise intake manifolds, as well as single and dual carburation. With a past like that, we feel a tribute is necessary, but to build a 427 FE nowadays would take deep pockets and great resource. And the FE is making a comeback, but to get one of those engines to make big power is a daunting task. Fortunately, there's an alternative to get the same cubic inches in a more compact, affordable, and powerful package. Nowadays, it's easy to get mid-60s big block cubic inch displacements to fit in conventional small blocks. Now, with the availability of killer induction packages and other awesome performance parts, these physically smaller engines will make more power than the earlier larger ones. This engine package will be available from Summit Racing under one part number, and we're calling it the Windsor Warrior 427. Its foundation is this level 20 CNC fully prepped 351 block from DSS Racing. It undergoes 35 plus operations and is dyno proven to make more power than a standard production block. Features include elliptical cylinder chamfers, equalized CNC deck surfaces, threaded freeze plugs, pre-clearance for large strokes, and the list goes on and on. Now we've already mocked up our rotating assembly and set all of our bearing clearances, so assembly is ready to begin. With the main bearings, make sure to set your clearances based on your engine's purpose. This may require increasing or reducing bearing clearance. On high performance engines, the rule of thumb is one thousandth of an inch of clearance per one inch of shaft diameter. When it comes to quality and consistency, it's hard to beat an Eagle specialty product. That's why we're using their rotating assembly in this build. Now this crank has a 4170 stroke and is constructed from 4340 forged steel. Now it's so shiny because it's undergone Eagle's ESP armor treatment. Now that improves strength, reduces friction, and greatly improves the crank's ability to shed oil, which are all worth a little extra power. Royal Purple Max Tough Assembly Lube coats the bearings to prevent metal-to-metal -metal contact during initial fire-up. Now the crank is carefully dropped into the align hone mains. The main caps are filled with bearings and guided down on the main studs. We already set the bearing clearances and have between 29 and 31 ten thousandths. That means we're good to torque the mains to 90 pound-feet. Depending on the builder, everyone assembles an engine a little bit different. But as long as everything is measured and verified, that's no big deal. Now, due to the large stroke of this crankshaft, we are going to install the camshaft at this time to see if there's any interference between it and the big end of the rod. Because things tend to get a little tight down there, and it's better to find a problem now rather than when the whole short block is assembled. Since this is going to be a Summit Racing engine package, we decided to use an off-the-shelf cam. No secret special grind needed. This is from Howard's Cams, and it's a hydraulic roller. Duration at 50 thousandths lift is 253 degrees on the intake and 259 degrees on the exhaust. It has 112 degrees of lobe separation, 
and its operating range is from 3200 to 7200 RPM. Here's a quick tip. Make sure your dowel slides into the cam smoothly. If it doesn't and you have to pound it in, you run the risk of damaging the camshaft. Finally, the retaining plate is installed and torqued. The cam is captured, but we're not. See you after the break. The short block assembly continues. This trick flow double row timing set has nine different positions. Four retard, four advance, and straight up. We're going to install it straight up and see where it lands. These Eagle rods are 4340 forged steel as well. Now they're an H-beam design with a 6250 center to center length. Now with the 8740 rod bolts that come in them, there's no questioning that these rods are strong enough for our power level. Completing the quality and consistency of this rotating assembly are these Molly forged pistons made out of 4032 aluminum alloy. They're a flat top design with dual valve reliefs that measure in at six cc's, and they have unique features such as an ultra strong strutted construction, advanced skirt profiling that reduces drag and increases stability, specially profiled wrist pin bores, and high performance coatings like the phosphate coating over the entire piston and Molly's graffle skirt coating for dry start protection. With the number one piston and rod assembly in its bore, we'll degree the cam. Since this is a pump gas street engine, our goal is to have the cam installed two degrees advanced, which shouldn't be a problem with the amount of adjustability in the timing set. We hate to beat a dead horse, but this is exactly why you should degree your camshaft. With our timing set straight up, the cam actually comes in at four degrees advanced on its intake center line, which is not where we want it. And this is where stacked tolerances come into play, but fortunately, we can adjust it. By repositioning the crank sprocket to the two degrees retarded position, this will put the intake center line at 110 degrees, which is two degrees advanced. The rest of the bores can be filled with the rod and piston assemblies. An ARP tapered ring compressor for the piston's bore size makes installing them easy. Now if you feel excessive resistance when the rings get to the deck, stop. Don't force it in. Damage to a ring will happen. Using our ARP stretch gauge and the spec sheet from Eagle, we'll set our rod bolt stretch to the recommended range of 59 to 63 ten thousandths. Make sure you check every fastener. Bolt lengths may vary, so the dial indicator will have to be zeroed every time. DSS Racing align hones their blocks with the ARP studs and their main support system in place. So that's the way it's going back together. Now this support is CNC machined from 3 quarter inch 6061 T6 aluminum. Now its job is to dampen the harmonics that cause the main caps to walk back and forth at high RPM. It's positioned over the main studs and is a cost effective way to make it possible for a stock two bolt main block to handle 650 plus horsepower. Now an ARP oil pump drive goes in, followed by a high volume melling oil pump. Now due to the main support, a spacer is used between the pump and block. Finishing up the pump is a pickup that is paired up with the oil pan we'll be using. Up front, an all-star timing cover from Summit goes on. And back on the bottom, a one-piece Felpro oil pan gasket is laid in place. Finally, the crankcase is covered up with a nine-quart front sump road race oil pan. Now, ARP fasteners snug it down, and the compression stops in the gasket keep it from being pressed out due to over-tightening. This ATI damper hub goes on next. Never drive it on with a hammer. Use an installation tool. This is a two-piece design and neutral balanced. ATI dampers are approved for NHRA, NASCAR, and IHRA use. All nine fasteners must be in and torqued. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We just finished up our 427 cubic inch small block Ford short block. Now it's time to move upstairs. Now the bigger the engine's displacement, the more the heads have to flow CFM wise to make big power. Now it's hard to beat to set a small block Ford trick flow 225 high ports out of the box. Now these heads are fully CNC machined and have a 225 cc intake runner. 
The exhaust measures in at 95 cc's and is raised 750 thousandths of an inch. That's where they get the name, a high port. Now the combustion chamber is heart shaped and measures in at 70 cc's. The intake valve is 2080, the exhaust an inch 600. Multi-layer steel head gaskets are the performance standard for sealing the heads to the block. And these Chromatics have a 40 thousandths compressed thickness. Now they were chosen because our piston actually sticks out of the deck 7 thousandths. Now combine that with our 70 cc chamber and our 6 cc valve relief and you get a calculated compression ratio of 11.30 to 1. These heads were ordered set up for our hydraulic roller valve train. Our valve lift is 640 thousandths and they flow north of 325 CFM at that lift. ARP head bolts will anchor them to the block. Using ultra torque lube, our final pass is 100 pound feet. Howard's offers a great set of roller lifters to go with their camshaft. They're a tie bar style which keeps them aligned with the cam lobes during operation. To complement the excellent flowing cylinder heads, TrickFlow developed their own manifold. It's an R-series designed for heavily modified engines. Operating range is from 3,500 to 7,500 RPM. It has a generous plenum area and is even cast with bosses for nitrous or fuel injection. For cooling purposes, this Spectre water neck is installed. We don't run thermostats in the engines on the dyno. It has one built in. Electric water pumps don't rob power on the dyno due to parasitic drag. This Mazir pump flows 42 gallons per minute and has a 3,000 plus hour life expectancy. Trick flow tall valve covers are going on to keep anything from getting in the engine when we load it on the dyno oh, cart, snug. which happens now. Off to the lie detection chamber. Now we're all loaded up and headed to the dyno room. Cool. Superflow makes this process so quick and easy with their docking carts. Oh, look, Beautiful. it's all set up for a Windsor. <laughs> Beautiful. High performance engine builds require custom length push rods pretty much every time. We call trend performance when we need a set. These are 7900 in length and have an 80 thousandths wall thickness and are 5 16 in diameter. Making the link to the valves are the TrickFlow extruded aluminum roller rockers. These are a 1.6 ratio and mount on 7 16 studs. They have needle bearing fulcrums and a machined relief in the body to clear large diameter valve springs. Stud girdles may be overkill for a hydraulic roller valve train with low spring pressures, but we set it up this way just in case we want to swap out for a solid roller at a later time. Their job is to eliminate flex on the rocker studs present with high spring pressures. Now the valve covers go on for good. The passenger one was fitted with a breather for crankcase evacuation. Our dyno headers are a set of Cook's inch and three quarter to inch and seven eighths stepped. They have a three and a half inch collector. Royal Purple XPR 5W30 will keep the vitals lubed. And as always, we'll prime it before fire up. Now the MSD Pro Billet distributor is dropped in and topping off the engine and feeding it is a quick fuel 950 CFM carb. The wires connect to E3 Diamond Fire plugs and with all that, Project Windsor Warrior 427 is now complete. You'll see and hear it run after the break. Four to 68. I like it. 28. Good deal. Hey, we're back and ready to see what our Windsor Warrior 427 is capable of. Now, we already broke it in, changed the oil, and cut the filter open, and it shows no sign of any foreign matter. So the first pull is going to be at 28 degrees of timing from 4,000 to 6,800 RPM. Nice. Nice and smooth. Shakes the floor. Not too shabby. That's a, that's a great first pull right there. 608 horse, <laughs> 549 pound feet of torque. Man, nice. that is spicy. Nice looking graph. That's a, that's a nice looking pump gas engine right there. 28 degrees of time in 608. Yeah, there's going to be a little left in it. Not much because it has a great chamber and a flat top. So it's not going to take a lot of timing, but we're going to give it a little Let's more. Let's find it. We'll make our standard timing change by bumping it up two degrees for a total of 30. All right, see how she rips. With an increase of 200 RPM to 7,000, here we go. That was decent. 
not bad. 610 horse, 562 pound-feet of torque. That was worth two degrees. That's two degrees. That, that's actually kind of surprising because we're going to find the limit pretty quick on this yeah. one because it's, it's not going to pick up incrementally much after this. We'll do another two degree timing increase for a total of 32. All right, here we Give go. Give the business. I don't know if it liked that or not. Did not like that at all for some reason. That, that's pretty interesting. 552 for torque and it made 600. Now, being a pump gas engine, quality of gas sometimes comes into play and all that stuff, but still, we're still cranking 600 horse at, oh, at, at 32 degrees of timing, so very efficient engine. Now, uh, let, man, I, I got an idea. I know this is crazy, but uh, you know how you always talk about what, um, you know, people put, like if you want to put a bigger carburetor, it floods an engine or something like that? It's not really the case. We have that 1150 that was on the big block. Dominator, yep. Yep, well, I, I have a, uh, a Dominator adapter. Let's put the Dominator on this thing and see what it does. I like your thinking. That's gonna be cool. In reality, this 950 CFM carb we're removing isn't all that much smaller than this Holly 1150 CFM Ultra Dominator we're installing. It'll be interesting to see what it does. It fired right up with no overfueling or idle issues. Not even a hesitation or stumble to the wide open throttle position. It's right back up, 609 horse, 551 pound feet of torque. I think we stroke this stroker for <laughs> all it's worth at this point right now. It, this is a great engine, uh, <laughs> easy build, um, great parts, easy to put together, no craziness, and uh, we got good power. Consider it a win. Nice. Today's tech tip has to do with the most critical fasteners in an engine. We've covered them before, but not very in depth. These are the fasteners that see the most stress during engine operation. Say hello to our little friends, the rod bolts. Like all bolts, they act like a spring. When torqued, the fastener stretches slightly, and that's what produces the clamp load necessary to hold it in place. When the fastener is loosened, it will return to its original free length as long as it's not a torque to yield fastener. In high performance engine builds, aftermarket fasteners are used because of their additional tensile strength due to them being manufactured of superior materials. Depending on the material, the manufacturer will call for a specific torque value and fastener stretch with a specific lube to achieve a proper clamp load. Don't rely on just the torque spec. Torque wrenches will vary in accuracy. The correct way to measure stretch is with a rod bolt stretch gauge like this one. Quality aftermarket fasteners will have indents on the top and bottom of the bolt for the gauge to register in. Now we're going to show you why it's important to have and utilize a rod bolt stretch gauge. Now this rod is equipped with ARP 2000 rod bolts. The recommended torque spec is 75 pound feet using ARP ultra torque lube. Now the actual range of rod bolt stretch they need to be in is between 64 and 68 10 thousandths. With no load on the bolt, the first step is to put the gauge on it and zero it out. Now remove the gauge and torque the fastener to 75 pound feet. Now the gauge is reinstalled and the reading shows we have 45 10 thousandths, which is not inside the specified stretch range. So what does this mean? Well, the fastener will not come loose. It just doesn't have the proper amount of stretch to achieve maximum clamping load. Now to get that, we're gonna actually have to torque the fastener at a higher value than recommended to get into that range. And the best way to do that is to actually loosen the fastener and then increase our torque wrench in five pound increments until we get in that range. With an increase of five to 80 pound feet, the stretch increased to 55 10 thousandths, so we have to keep going. All said and done, we had to set our torque wrench to 95 pound feet to be within the 64 to 68 10 thousandths range. Now you know what it takes to properly set up your rod bolts, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your torque wrench is inaccurate. So to verify its accuracy, we'll set it back on 75 pound feet and give it a click on our tester. Manufacturers keep the torque specs on the low side to keep you out of trouble. See you next week.